We're good? Yep. Thank you. All right, greetings. Um, what I'd like to do today is present you some of the solutions to some of the problems that uh, I've talked about. Uh, one of them is on the slide on electric potential energy. If you go back to part A of chapter 23, you'll find in slide number 25, there is a little problem about a power plate capacitor. And I'd like to uh, solve it for you, and I'd like you to pay attention on how we set up problems, how we set up a solution. Again, the last thing we want to do is think in terms of um, formulas. The idea is really to do a, an analysis which will guide the strategy, and eventually the formulas will fall in very naturally. So the problem is about this horizontal um, uncharged power plate capacitor or spacing D. So we start by starting by doing the, a nice drawing of quality. We have our spacing D, the two power plate capacitor. We're going to call this one the positive charge and this one the negative charge. And we take a small bead of mass M and charge Q, but the Q doesn't really matter for the very beginning. And we launch it straight up from the bottom plate and it reaches a maximum height inside the power plate capacitor. We're going to call that a Y max or Y apogee, doesn't really matter. And we're going to orient our axis in the positive direction this way. We ignore drag, that's good. And then the next aspect of the problem is we're told that uh, the power plate capacitor is now charged with the bottom plate set at negative uh, polarity, which is what I have indicated right here anyway. And uh, find the electric field so, such that the bead's maximum height is only Y max over two. So we're looking for the electric field such that Y max or such that the, max, the Y apogee is equal to one half of what we had earlier without the electric field. All right, so um, it looks like this is somewhat of a two-step process. So we have two situations. First, the power, the power plate capacitor being uncharged, and we have a particle being launched upwards. There is no mention of a speed, but we know that they're going to be obviously a launch speed, a certain V sub zero pointing upwards in order to launch the particle up. In the absence of E field, so in the step one, or phase one, if you want to think it better, phase one of this problem, we have E equals zero. The particle is only subjected to the force of gravity. Therefore, we have a free fall. The particle is in free fall. If the particle is in free fall, it is in uniform, uniformly accelerated motion. You can re remember that, UAM, uniformly accelerated motion. The kinematic equations are applicable. So we look, well, we have initially a launch speed and we have a height. So that kind of drives us to write that the V final squared is equal to the initial squared minus 2G times a certain height Y. That's your kinematic equations governing the motion. In the situation where we reach Y max, at Y at Y equals Y max, obviously we have V final is equal to zero. That gives us out of this equation, zero equals V zero squared minus two G Y max, out of which we extract Y max equals V zero squared divided by two G. Here's a, an element of the solution. So this was a situation where the electric field was zero. Now we look at the second phase where the electric field is not equal to zero. So something else is obviously changing, phase where E is not equal to zero. So what happens inside the parallel plate capacitor? What we develop an electric field, and the electric field is pointing downwards inside the parallel plate capacitor. What happens to the particle? Well, the particle being charged is subjected now to a set of forces, not only the force of gravity, which is acting downwards, but we also have the electric force, Fe, or F electric, if you want to stick to the way we've done it in class. These two forces are acting against the motion of the particle. 
So what's going to happen? Clearly in the presence of electric field, this charge will not reach Y max. Its height is going to be limited because now we have a new force trying to pull it down. Well, it sounds like it's going to be exactly the same type of problem that we have here, except that we have to work on the acceleration. The acceleration is not g anymore, but it is a little less than g. Well, what is it? Well, we recognize that the particle is in uniform accelerated motion. Why is that so? Because it's subjected to g and subjected to e, which is a constant. A constant field will give us a constant force, therefore a constant acceleration. I can again use the kinet uh, well, I can use the kinematic equations, but before we get to them, we have to use Newton's second law because we need to, to eventually get to the acceleration. And acceleration is given out of Newton's second law in a very natural way. So using Newton's second law, because the motion is accelerated, and then the second law says that the sum of all external forces acting on the system is equal to ma. And of course, the system for Newton's second law is just the object of interest, which is going to be then the particle by itself. Writing it out, we have two forces. We have Fg plus F electric in vector form is equal to ma. Do not skip any steps. One step at a time. What do we do next? Well, we have to project this equation onto the y-axis, both with an axis pointing towards the top. The components of the vectors are going to be negative. So will the acceleration. So in fact, we have negative throughout this equation. So the projection gives me negative mg minus f electric, which is what? Well, which is simply qe. And this is equal to negative ma. A being the acceleration, being a positive number at this point, because I've already used the negative sign indicating that the acceleration is pointing down. Which gives us the acceleration in a very simple way, g plus q over m e. Here's the acceleration that the particle is subjected to when plunged inside the parallel plate capacitor in the presence of an electric field. On we go. So we're going to say that now we know the acceleration, the kinematic equations for the motion corresponding to the velocity, v final squared is equal to v0 squared the launch speed, minus 2 times the acceleration, which is g plus q over m e, and then times the height, which is going to be some y. And we want the maximum height to be y max over 2. That's what we want. So we're going to inject y max over 2 into this equation, and at that point, it's going to make vf equal 0. So we're going to write 0 equals v0 squared minus 2g plus q over m e times y max over 2. So finally, we have an equation that contains our unknown e. Y max is, 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 is it known? Well, not really. It's not known. And then we have v0, which is not known. So we're in a, we don't have enough equation. But we recall what we did earlier. Earlier, we had found that y max was equal to v0 squared over 2g. So we're going to inject y max inside that equation. Uh, or we can inject v, uh, replace v0 squared by its value as a function of y max. Let's do that. So we replace v0 squared as 2g y max minus 2g plus q over m e y max over 2. So notice the beauty of this equation because, well, Besides the two canceling out, most importantly, y max cancels out as well. So what are we left with? Uh, taking the g on the left, we get negative g equals, I'm left with neg uh, negative g plus q over m e. And then I have a one half that comes in from way back there. So negative one half. Of course, the negative cancel each other. 
multiplying both sides by two, I have two G on the left side, and I'm gonna, gonna have a G coming from the from the right. That's gonna give me one G only equals Q over N E. We now solve for E, the electric field that will be such that the particle which is only y max over two is equal to mg over q. Here is the final answer. So this solution is not very complicated. And like a lot of physics solutions, it can be complicated if you don't set up the problem properly, if you don't do the analysis. This was pretty much a mechanics problem with the new introduction of an electric force, but the only thing that it was changing is the nature of the acceleration. It was not changing the physics of things. So I hope that you see how we set up these problems. We have to be particular about the details, how the drawings are set up, how the vectors, vector equations are set up. For example, the, the labeling of Newton's second law, and then the two expressions describing Newton's second law, the general expression followed by the expanded expression where we ha address the different forces acting onto the system, as well as the definition of the system. This is absolutely fundamental in physics. Without a system, the solution, the answer may be correct, but the solution may be incorrect. It's 131. Okay. You good? Thank you. You are my only audience. So. <laughs> All right. Um, another problem will, is coming from the practice problem, uh, chapter 23, that I posted. And this is called short, just like bread. Yes, short bread. I hope you're having a good laugh out of this one. So it's problem number five out of uh, this practice, problem chapter 23. So the question or the statement is, we consider a proton that is fired with an initial speed V0 equals 200,000 kilometers per second, slightly beyond the speed limit on the freeway, from the midpoint of a parallel plate capacitor towards the positive plate, and the pl positive plate is charged at 500 volts. In other words, the voltage across the capacitor is equal to 500 volts. Will the proton impact the positive plate? And what will be the impact speed of the proton when it reaches the negative plate, the bottom plate of the parallel plate capacitor? So here's how that works. We have a parallel plate capacitor with a positive plate at the top and a negative plate at the bottom. We take a, the V plus, the, part, the potential at the top plate is given to us. We have a V plus equals 500 volts. And we have a V minus, which is going to be zero anyway, because we consider that to be the ground, the reference potential. So if I don't mind the delta V kappa, the potential across the capacitor, or the capacitor, capacitor potential voltage is equal to 500 volts. That's really what that means. And we're given a proton that is currently sitting at the midpoint, if this is D, midpoint of the parabolic capacitor, and it is launched upward with an initial velocity V0. And this V0 is given to us. Uh, I had it earlier. V0 is equal to 200,000 kilometers per second. Notice that this is less than the speed of light, so we're okay. Will the proton impact the top plate? So, why do we have such a question? Well, obviously the proton does not want to approach the top plate. The top plate has the same po charge polarity as the proton. Um, therefore, the positive plate will repel the proton while the negative plate will tend to attract it. Finally, the proton is subjected to a force which is going to be the force the electric force, F electric, 
preventing it from or, or impeding, imp creating an impediment to its motion towards the top plate. All right. Well, let's uh, let's see if we can um, solve that problem. Well. The way we think about it is we have a particle, charged particle, inside a charged power plate capacitor. It means that should lead us to something about energy. So while we, this problem can probably be solved using forces, it's probably more efficient to do it, to do it using energy. So we're going to look at the system. First thing when we use energy is to define your system very accurately and you define it and you state it and you write it out. Well the system in this situation is the particle Q, the proton, in addition to what its surrounding is with what it interacts with, which we're going to call the parallel capacitor, sometimes you can call it the electric field, it doesn't really matter, but these are two objects that will interact with each other through the electric force. And we're going to say that this system, in the absence of any other external factors, i.e. we neglect gravity in this case, the system is isolated. If it is isolated, we have conservation of total energy, which we write as the change in the total energy it is equal to the change in kinetic plus the change in uh, electric potential energy. So, and because of conservation, that sum is equal to zero. So, trying to figure out if the proton reaches the top plate is to make sure that, or to verify whether there is enough initial energy in the proton to start with to reach that plate. So what do we have in terms of total energy initial? Well, we're launching it with a vertical speed, so we have some 1F of mv. V0 squared. Here's the kinetic energy of the proton initially. And then the proton is in the middle of that uh, parallel plate capacitor, so there is electric potential energy. How much? Well, some. U electric. Uh, call it sub zero because we've used sub zero to indicate the initial situation. Now, notice that this is a parallel plate capacitor for which we have voltage that's defined. And we remember that the voltage or the potential inside the parallel capacitor is a linear function of distance. So if I am right here at the midpoint, what is the value of this potential, this equipotential within the parallel capacitor? It's going to be my V plus over 2. Halfway up the capacitor, I am at the equipotential, half of what the voltage across the capacitor is. And we remember the relationship between the electric potential energy and the potential. So that gives us one half of mv0 squared plus q, the charge of the particle, times the potential where it is, which is now v plus over 2, or one half of v plus. Here is the amount of electric potential energy in the initial situation when the proton is just being launched from the midpoint of the pathway capacitor. Now, we need to verify, can it reach the top? So if they were to be able to reach the top, at the minimum, it would reach the top with zero speed. That would be the minimum for which, for which the, the proton would be able to reach the top. So what would be, the, in this situation, the TP final? Well, reaching the top with zero speed would give zero kinetic energy, and the electric potential energy of the proton then would be Q V plus, the full Q V plus. So the question is now, is T is T E I greater or equal to T E F? Do we have enough electric potential energy to reach the tall energy? Um, do we have enough tall energy to reach the tall energy final? And when you put the numbers in there, I'll let you do that, you'll discover that you do not have enough. You fall short. So the proton will climb up the potential, but will not reach the top, and eventually will turn around. This is the, the apogee of its trajectory. Turn around and come back down to impact the uh, bottom plate. 
which leads to the next question. Uh, what is the impact speed of the proton as it hits the bottom plate? So it's, again, we need to reason out. We have a proton that its trajectory is going upwards against the electric field, and it's coming back down, being pushed down by the electric field. So you might say, well, we need to know how high the, the electron is actually going up, uh, the proton is actually going up. But if you think in terms of gravity, you will realize that this is absolutely not needed. We don't care how high the proton goes. Why is that so? Well, because the electric force, just like the force of gravity, they are conservative forces. Being conservative, it tells us that the speed at which the particle comes back down at the launch point will, will also, again, be V0. So finally, we are at the level halfway inside the parallel plate capacitor with an initial velocity pointing down of V0. That's another, um, an, an, another um, exercise of conservation of energy. So on we go. We still take the parallel plate capacitor and consider the proton and the parallel plate capacitor as a system. The system is isolated. We have conservation of total energy. You know, it's just a matter of rewriting the energy terms. We're starting with electric with um, kinetic energy, one half of m v zero squared. We're starting with some electric potential energy, plus q or one half of q v plus. And what's our termination? Well, we terminate on the negative plate where there is no electric potential energy because we're at the v equals zero potential, s equals zero, and the only thing that we have is one half of m v squared. Well, we know all the elements. We can extract Vf out of this. If we're looking for the speed, it's just going to simply, simply be the square root of uh, the 2 cancels out, the m cancels out. I'm going to have V0 squared plus Q over m. Here is the speed of impact of the particle on the negative plate. So again, this is a fairly simple problem as long as you set it up properly and you justify all the, the different steps. And justification requires sentences. Uh, the best sentence contains a subject, a verb, and if you're really skilled, you put an adjective or a complement to it. Um, what if they were asking you um, out of this problem, what would be the um, electric field? the electric field within the parabolic capacitor. This is an extension of the exercise. Well, if you wanted to you know the electric field, you would have to find a relationship between the electric field and the electric potential. And you remember that the delta V capa capacitor is equal to E times the spacing between the two plates. The way you sort of memorize that is V is in uh, voltage is in volts, distance, and indeed, the unit is volt per meter for the electron for the electric field, so that works. So to know the electric field, we would have to be told something about the spacing of the place, which we are not given. But that would be a, another type of uh, question that might be given. What if they were asking you, uh, what is the charge on the plates? Well, we need to find a relationship between the charge on the plates and the electric field. Well, something we haven't seen really yet in class, but the electric field inside the parallel plate capacitor is very simply sigma over epsilon zero. So if you knew the electric field from this relationship, you would find very easily the uh, charge held by the plates. That would be a nice little problem. Well, that uh, closes this exercise. All right, now we're going to go to the um, handout on chapter 21 slash 22. There is an interesting exercise, uh, a little bit challenging. That I, it's exercise number six. I called it assembling Rodinia. And those of you there. Geologists probably know that Rodinia was a supercontinent 
that existed about one billion years ago and eventually broke apart 600 million years ago. So Rod, Enya, hope you appreciate the, jo the joke again. Um, this is a little more challenging problem. And the reason I like this one is again, because it shows you how you set up integral, which is really a, a critical element in this class. You're given an infinite sheet of charge, of surface charge density sigma. It can be thought of as consisting of an infinite number of agent, adjacent uniformly charged rods. Indeed, think about this plane that is charged. And you can think of it as being made of a lot, an infinite number of infinitesimal little rods set side by side, each of them carrying a surface, a, a linear charge density. And when you set them up this way, you can integrate over the whole surface and you, and you would get the electric field created by that infinite plane of charge. So we're given a little bit of information using the fact that the field from a uniformly charged rod is E rod is equal to lambda divided by two pi epsilon zero r. R, of course, being the distance where you measure. Remember, in class, we also wrote it as 2 lambda divided by 4 pi epsilon 0 r. Sometimes that helps because we get the 4 pi epsilon 0. Remember, there's no k in this class. Everything is epsilon 0. And the question is, based on this, and through an integration, demonstrate that E of the plane, the infinite plane, is sigma over 2 epsilon 0. So conceptually, it sort of makes sense, and we start talking about it. You can imagine that a plane is made of an infinite number of thin slices, and if you integrate over all these slices on the surface of the plane, you should be able to reconstruct the electric field created by that charge distribution. So imagine that you have a sigma right there. So the, the idea is that how can we connect? We're going to have to make a connection between the surface charge density and this little lambda, which is a linear charge density associated with a rod. And because we want to integrate it, we're going to have to use an elemental uh, linear charge density. So in other words, I am trying to connect an elemental charge density, d lambda, corresponding to this small width uh, strip of the, uh, the plane, a certain value d lambda, and relating it to sigma, the surface charge density. Well, we're going to call this the x-axis. So that gives me a certain width of dx of that infinitesimal uh, line of charge. So the connection is very simply this. In other words, I break down my surface charge density into an infinite number of little d lambda such that the, each d lambda is proportional to the surface charge density times the width of that elemental rod. So if you look at units, it works. The uh, lambda is a coulomb per meter. Sigma is coulomb per meter squared. Dx is meters. So we have the connection between these rods and the surface, the surface charge density of the rod, uh, of the plane. So now we need to figure out, take a point P on top of that surface along a z-axis. And we're going to take point P here at the distance, say, H over the plane. And we're going to take our axis x pointing this way. So now hopefully you see in 3D what, what I'm looking at. And we're going to try to use symmetry. Once again, symmetry is important. So instead of using one infinitesimal rod, we're going to take two symmetrically located with respect to the center of the plane, or, or my choice of line. There's no center for an infinite surface, but I pick an air, a position on the plane. And I'm going to look at what is the effect of these two infinite lines of charge, infinitesimal lines, lines of charge, on point P. Well, if we assume a positively charged 
plane, well, each of them will produce an infinitesimal field, which is radial out. Here is the DE produced by the two lines, infinite lines of charge. Remember, the electric field is radial out from a line of charge. Imagine this is your line of charge. We've not looked at it this way in class. We've thought of the line of charge as being vertical. Here we're setting it horizontally. So your symmetry, your cylindrical symmetry is along that, uh, that line of charge. So the net field, obviously, it's going to be strictly along the z-axis. You can see that the, the vector construction will give us a net field along the z-axis. So the only thing that we wor worry about is therefore the DE along the z-axis. That's going to be the projection of the electric field on the z-axis. So if I take, uh, what's the best way? If I choose theta right here, I'm going to have a location right here of x with respect to the origin. I'm going to use this angle theta as well, so I'm projecting onto the z-axis. DEZ is going to be the DE times cosine theta. Here's the elemental field created by one line of charge along the z-axis. And now it's a matter of replacing the different elements and going through the interval. So what is the DEZ? Well, the DE is the electric field created by a line of charge, which is going to be this value, except that we're going to use the D lambda equals to this. So we have sigma dx divided by 2 pi epsilon 0 r cosine theta. Here is the elemental electric field created by one elemental line of charge of width dx carrying a, uh, on a plane of surface charge density sigma. Now it's a matter of integrating over the surface of the plane. So we have two things. We have a, when we integrate, we have two things that are going to be varying. We're going to be moving across the plane, so the x is changing, and of course theta is changing. And I believe we're given a hint that we might want to use an in, a form of integration based on an angle. So the idea is we're going to keep the angular, angular term and we're going to try to change the dx and maybe the r, uh, well, uh, keeping everything as a function of an angle. By the way, the r is going to be this little distance right there. So on we go. Uh, what is my, how can I write x? x is the, uh, I'm going to express x and h as a function of theta. So I have tangent theta is equal to x over h. So that gives me x is equal to h tangent theta. Uh, which I can calculate the, the differential. dx is equal to h, which is a constant. And the differential of tangent theta is d theta over cosine squared theta. And you're, if you insist on using the other trig functions, that's your punishment. I do not. Here is the dx. Now, what is r? r now is the hypotenuse of this right angle triangle. So, what do we have? Well, we're going to try to express r as a function of h and keeping this. So, we're going to have cosine theta is equal to h over r. Therefore, the r term is going to be equal to h over cosine theta. Okay, we now have all our terms that are going to be expressed as a function of theta only. And we'll be ready for the integration. All right, we'll go. Oops, I should rely uh, on that expression. So, we have dez equals sigma over 2 pi epsilon 0. What do we have? We have dx, which is going to be h d theta over cosine squared theta. 
we have an R in the denominator, and R is H over cosine theta. So it's going to be H, and then over cosine theta, the cosine theta goes on top. And then we're still left with that one little lonely cosine theta that we'll bring again here. Here it is. So now, what do we do? Well, we look at simplifications. Cos cosine, cosine, cosine squared cancels out with this one. That's absolutely extraordinary. That gives us sigma over 2 pi epsilon 0 d theta. Who would have thought that we'd get such an easy expression? Principle of superposition. The net field E of the plane is going to be the integral of DEZ. So it's going to be the integral of sigma over 2 pi epsilon 0 and then d theta. Now we need to figure out what the limits of integrations are going to be. Well, we go back to our diagram. We notice that to integrate over the whole plane going to infinity on both sides, the angle will start at negative pi over 2 and going all the way to positive pi over 2. So from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. That range will cover the full surface of the plane. Integrating that is pretty easy because all this is constant. So that gives me sigma over 2 pi epsilon 0. And pi over 2 minus minus pi over 2 gives me pi. What do we find? E of the plane is equal to pi canceled out sigma over 2 epsilon 0. Bingo. This is indeed the electric field of an, of an infinite plane of charge. Again, no dependence on the height, only dependence on the amount of charge that infinite plane is holding. So this problem required a little bit of um, calculus, integrals. The critical element really was this, the hinge, the, the ticket that allowed you to do this, this calculation was to recognize that the elemental linear charge density can be expressed as a function of the surface charge density times the elemental width. And after that, you kind of run the machine. After that, fundamentally up to here, uh, well, actually, I'm going to push it here. All the way to here, this is physics. All the way here. This is math. And then we regain the physics right here. And all problems are this way. You start with the physics, physical analysis. You look at how you can construct your equations. And you allow the equations to sort of guide you. I always like to describe it as if you were a rider, a horse, a horse rider. You do not tell the rider, where the, the horse, where to set its hooves. It will do that for you. You just tell it where to go. That's what you do. You tell the equations where you want to go and you allow the equations to guide you. Uh, all right, so the next one I'd like to do is uh, a problem which is also in that same handout, so the, the problem on chapter 21, 22. And this is the one that I call going spherical. So you probably have seen it uh, either in I don't remember if that was one of the ones that I had assigned in homework or not, out of mastering physics. But even if I have assigned it, it doesn't matter. I want to show you the full solution. And how we set up the solution on such a problem. Which is really not difficult once you've seen them all. But again, practice, practice, practice with meaning, with intent. So going spherical, the uh, idea was to take a solid sphere of radius r, which holds a total charge q. So here is your sphere of radius r, holding a certain charge big q. The volume the charge density is, a, is not constant. The charge is not uniformly distributed inside the material. But the charge density rho, the volume charge density, is some rho zero, one minus little r over big r. So this 
So at a given location, little r inside the sphere, this would be the value of the charge density. So when r is equal to zero, we have a certain amount of charge density in the center, but as r increases, the charge density decreases, and notice that when r is equal to big R, i.e. when I've reached the, um, the surface of the sphere, my charge density is zero. So we have a linearly decreasing charge density, maximum in the center, zero on the surface of the sphere. First question was, show that rho zero has the following expression. 3q divided by pi r q. So first thing we look is, does it make any sense from a perspective of, of units? We know that rho zero has the same unit as the volume charge density, because it should be coulomb per cubic meters. Cubic, coulomb per cubic meters. So that seems to be consistent. How do we it, calculate that? How, how do we know that rho zero has to be this? What well, we think, we have a, a non-uniform charge density. If we integrate that charge density over the whole sphere, we should get back to the total charge held by the sphere. That's the path that we're going to take to verify that rho zero is equal to this value. What we're going to do is we're going to indicate that the total Q held by the sphere is equal to the integral over the sphere. That's a volume integral in the most general case. So if you want to make it the triple integral, I'll let you do that. But we won't even need it due to the symmetry here. So it's going to be the charge rho, which is a function of r, so that's how I would write it, times a d tau, an elemental volume, that will allow me to, to integrate over the surface. Well, the elemental volume for a sphere, where we have such a symmetry, it's going to be what is the volume of a small shell here, of radius r, thickness dr, well that d tau is going to be equal to that the volume held by that shell, that, that spherical shell, is going to be the product of the, circum the surface area of the shell, which is going to be 4 pi r squared, times the elemental width of that shell, which is times dr. So notice this is indeed a volume, meter squared times meter gives you meters cubed. So all we need now is to replace the different elements inside this integral. Rho, well, we have rho zero, one minus r over big R, and d tau, four pi r squared dr. And what are we integrating on? We're integrating over the whole sphere. Our variable integration is a small radius. We're going from zero, the center of the sphere, all the way to big R the uh, total radius of the sphere. So now this is the end of the physics problem. We move on to the mathematical solution, which is solving that um, integral. Well, that's probably not very difficult. The easiest way to do it is probably to break it into two integrals. So we're going to have q is equal to rho zero, uh, the integral from zero to big R, of the first term. So this is going to be 1 times the d tau. So 4 pi r squared dr plus, now taking care of the second term, which has a negative sign, minus rho 0. And the integral is now r over big R and 4 pi r squared dr. And integrating, of course, from 0 to big R. OK, first term, rho 0. Then r squared dr gives me an r cube, or one third of r cube, and integrated between r and zero gives me four pi over three r big r cube, which just happens to be uh, the volume of the, the sphere, right there, the total sphere, minus rho zero. So now we have four pi big over, let's take it out, four pi over big R, these are my constant. Then inside the integral I have R times R squared gives an R cubed dr. The integral of that is one fourth of R to the fourth power, taken between big R and zero, R 
to the fourth power. So what do we have? Well, four cancels out. One of the R cancels out. We're left with rho zero, four pi over three R cubed, minus rho zero. We left here with uh, pi R cubed. So we have four, four third minus three third, which leaves us with one third of rho zero pi r cubed. And this is equal to q. So extracting rho zero out of this, we find that rho zero, rho naught, is equal to three q divided by pi r cubed, as expected. So rho zero fundamentally is a normalization term. It ensures that the integral of the charge density, the volume charge density, that integral over the whole sphere is equal to the total charge held by the sphere. That's the purpose of that rho zero, and that's its value then. Next question. Show that the electric field inside the sphere is radial out with a certain magnitude, and we're given the magnitude as a function of the radius. So let's get rid of that. And we want to calculate finally what is the electric field E as a function of R with R less or equal to big R. The electric field within the sphere. So how do we handle this? Well, we handle it cautiously. Where is the big R? So, we want to know the electric field at this location, little r, within the sphere. Well, of course, we have spherical symmetry of the charge distribution. So, if we're thinking spherical symmetry, we want to think probably maybe in terms of Gauss's law. Why not? So if we use spherical symmetry, we're going to use a closed surface, which is going to be a sphere of radius little r within the big sphere. And we're going to write Gauss's law, which states that the, uh, the flux of E dot dA, or the integral, rather, uh, the closed integral of E dot dA on that little sphere of radius r is equal to the Q enclosed within that sphere divided by epsilon zero. And that sphere, by the way, because it mimics the, charge, the symmetry of the charge distribution, this is really a true Gaussian surface as we have defined it in class. So the integral should be very simple. Well, we have a positive charge uh, sphere. Obviously, at the electric field is going to be by symmetry radial out and of constant magnitude on the sphere because we're at a constant distance from the center and the, the charge uh, density is spherically symmetrical. So we, and if we of course take a small dA on that elemental sphere, we have dA radial out always. So my E dot dA is formally just E dA. E being constant, I can take it out of the integral. I'm left with E integral of dA is equal to Q enclosed over epsilon zero. And the integral over the sphere of dA is obviously just the surface of the sphere. So this is going to be E times 4 pi r squared equals Q enclosed over epsilon zero. So we have taken care of the left side of the equation, so Gauss's law. Now we need to tackle the Q enclosed, which is typically takes a little bit more time than or a little more work than um, the left side. Well, Q enclosed, what is I going to do? Well, Q enclosed is a charge held within that sphere. And we're given the surface charge density. So the Q enclosed is going to be the integral of the charge density, which is a function of R, times d tau, the elemental volume uh, that I'm going to use to calculate that integral. 
So again, this is exactly the same calculation that we did earlier, but now we're using little r. So we still have this small shell, a spherical shell. If using the same d tau, we're still going to use it as rho zero, the integral from zero to big r of one minus r over big r, and then the d tau is the same as what we had earlier, four pi r squared d r. And on we go. We can calculate this integral the same fashion that we have calculated it previously. Uh, I'm gonna get rid of this part. So Q enclosed. Oh, actually, we're not going from big R, we're only going to little r. We're integrating all the way to that um, Gaussian surface, which is defined by little r. So Q enclosed, rho zero. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to break it down into two integrals. The first one, the integral from zero to little r of four pi r squared dr, and then minus rho zero and the integral little r over big r, 4 pi r squared dr, which is exactly the same integral that we had earlier, except the limits of integration are different. We used to go all the way to big r. Here, we're only going all the way to little r. But, so the integral is very easy. Rho 0, uh, that gives us 4 thirds of pi little r cubed minus rho 0. And then we have 4 pi over big R, and then R to the third becomes 1 fourth of R to the fourth power. So the Q enclosed becomes, I have a 4 and a 4 that cancels out. I have 4 thirds, or 0, 4 thirds. 4 thirds of pi r cubed minus, and then all I'm left here is pi r to the fourth over big R. Okay? So that leads us to, we can probably simplify a little bit. We can take Q enclosed, and now we're going to try to shape it based on what we're given. And what we're given is uh, just the four third. So we're going to take pi r cube. So rho zero, pi r cube. And we're going to take. three out, the third out. And again, I'm working based on the expression that is given to us. So what are, what are we left with? Well, we're left with the first term, we're just missing the coefficient four, and the last term is we're missing an r, we're missing a big r, the negative sign, and then if we have pulled a three out, we need to bring the three back up. You can verify that these two equations are equal. So that's it. We have now our Q enclosed, and we can calculate the electric field. E times 4 pi r squared equals Q enclosed, rho 0 pi r cubed over 3 epsilon 0, 4 minus 3 little r over the r. And now we can replace, well, we're first looking at a few simplifications, a pi and a pi r squared and an r cubed, we're left with an r on the right side. So, and then the 4 comes down under, that gives me e equals rho 0 r divided by 12 epsilon 0, then 4 minus 3 r over big r. Again, this is just mathematics at this point, no complication. Continuing on, now I can get rid of all this. 
I'm going to replace row 0 by what I know it is from the previous question. So replacing, I have E equals row 0, 3Q over pi big R cubed. I have a little r, I have a 12 epsilon 0 that's still sitting down in the denominator. And then the rest is unchanged. 4 minus 3 little r over big r. Simplifications, obviously, we have e is equal to 3 over 12 gives a 4 in the denominator, so 4 pi epsilon 0. What else? I have q at the top. I have a little r here and 4 minus 3 little r over big r. And then in the denominator, I drop the r cube. Which is indeed the expression that we're given. Here is the field as a function of r within the sphere, i.e. for little r less or equal to big r. So a much more complicated expression than what we're used to just because we have a charge distribution that is uh, linear within the sphere. The next question is, is the field continuous across the surface of the sphere compared to the situation of the charge, sur of the charge surface of a conductor? So pushing this expression for little r equals big R, A of big R. So if you do little r equals big O, by the way, we haven't looked at the units of this thing, and we better do this. So we have Coulomb in the denominator, in the numerator, that works. Epsilon zero in the denominator, that works. And then we have r over r cubed, which is a meter squared down here, so we're okay right here. We have all the terms that we need. And this parenthesis is unitless, dimensionless, four minus ratio of two distances. So unit-wise, we're good. So at big R, I have 4 minus R, 3 R over R. 4 minus 3 is 1. I would be left with Q over 4 pi epsilon 0 R Q times big R, which is finally Q over 4 pi epsilon 0 R squared. So we do find, again, the electric field due to a sphere of charge, the electric field as a surface of a sphere of charge, holding a charge Q. Finally, how the charge is distributed does not affect the shape of the electric field outside the sphere. Again, assuming spherical symmetry, of course. So here's this value at the surface. What is the value um, outside? So finally, what, what it is, is we're coming on this side here, and we find that E from the inside is equal to that of the surface. And the electric field outside if I were to come from this side, looking at the electric field and using uh, Coulomb's law from that perspective, which is derived from uh, Gauss's law, we would also find that Q over 4 pi epsilon 0 r squared. We find that there is a continuity of the electric field across the interface, which is not the case if you had a sphere of a conductive sphere of charge. Because if you had a sphere of charge, a conductor, then the electric field will be zero inside. And the electric field will be that much outside. So you would have a continuity. Here, the fact that we have a dielectric tells us that the electric field is continuous across the interface. It's a characteristic of dielectric, charged dielectrics. Little d. Through simple algebraic manipulations, show that the expression for the field can be transformed into a normalized function, f of u, dependent only on the new normalized variable u equals little r over big R. So this is a very important uh, technique that engineers use quite a bit, and you'll read a lot of textbooks that uses this technique of normalization. Finally, normalization means that transforming an expression so it, so, um, it is only dependent on ratios of things holding the same unit. In other words, the function becomes dimensionless. And they guide us and they tell us, let's express it as a function of u, which is little r over big r. And we want to transform that into a certain function f of u, which will be only dependent on u. And we'll have all these complexities, these specific um, 
values associated with the specificity of the problem gone. So that it's applicable to many different situations and not just this one. All right, how can we do that? Well, we recognize we already have some little r over big r right there. So we have a u right here. And we have almost a u right here. So we're going to force it to appear. That's what we do. When we want something in physics, we force it. We force it with kindness. So that becomes q over 4 pi epsilon 0. I'm keeping an r squared at the r cubed. So I'm left with little r over big r right here, which is u. And then in the parentheses, 4 minus 3 u. Now what do I have here? Well, that's an electric field. And that happens to be the electric field of the total sphere. So it's some E sub 0, E naught. It's the electric field of the whole sphere. So I'm going to divide both sides by E sub naught. So E over E0 is equal to U. 4 minus 3u. Now e over e0 is a dimensionless fraction. It's a ratio of two fields. So that is a normalized function as a function of the normalized parameter u. So we have created indeed now a new function, f of u, electric field, which is that expression, exactly the same, it has, but inside here, all the physics is present, without the complexity of all these little different numbers, everything has been swallowed in into f and little u, They're vastly more powerful, again, the essence of the physics is maintained, and this is contained in that equation, that's why these normalized functions are so important in in engineering and in physics and in a lot of fields. You'll find textbooks or uh, yeah, technical books that will plot functions that are totally dimensionless like that. So that everybody that uses this textbook will be able to use it with its, towards its own application with its own specificity without having to rederive everything. Extremely powerful. So out of this we can draw what the function looks like. And that's the beauty of this because we have now a plot of the electric field which is now the function f of u. Again, this is a ratio of the field to e sub 0 as a function of u. So we have to be careful. It's a function we've just calculated is only valid until little r is equal to big R, that is u equals 1. Again, u is equal to little r over big R. So that expression is only valid within this range. What happens at u equals 0? u equals 0 gives you a, a field, a function, a normalized function equals 0. And at u equals 1, that is on the surface, well, I get 4 minus 3, which is uh, 1, times 1 gives me 1. The function here is maximum at 1, at 1. What is the shape of that? Well, you can do some quick calculations. You can use the power calculus to do that. You'll discover that the function peaks inside. Actually, it's probably, it peaks further out. You do the full calculation. about the shape of the function. And then outside, what do we have? When u is greater than 1, i.e. when little r, which is the same thing as saying little r is greater than r. Well, we know that the electric field is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 rho q, um, yeah, q over uh, little r squared, right? So I can do the same transformation. It's going to be 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. I'm going to try to bring big R squared right here and Q out here. Because then I find again what I had used earlier, the E sub 0. But now I need to adjust the rest and I have an R squared divided by the R squared. 
So I recognize my E0, E0, and then the ratio R squared divided by little r squared, which is 1 over u squared. So I have E divided by E0, which is now a, I can call it a G of u, a new function, because that's the field outside the sphere, is equal to 1 over u squared. So you have a parabolic variation outside the sphere going this way, with a continuity of the electric field at the surface of the sphere. So this is really interesting right here, the fact that the electric field within the sphere is stronger than what it is at the surface. And that has to do with how the charge density varies. So we got to, why would that be so? So that's where the physics comes in again. We're thinking, as you move further and further away from the center of the sphere, the radius increases. So the surface area increases. The volume increases. The volume that's enclosed increases. And the charge increases. So everything is increasing. In other words, at that point, this is where the increase in surface uh, starts to be faster than the increase in the charge held within that surface. So right here, the charge increases faster than the surface area. And right here, this is now the surface area that starts to become that starts to grow faster than the charge that is L because you have reached a certain, a certain radius that's large enough that the, um, the surface area increases faster than <coughs> the charge that's held within. So that's the fundamental analysis that we need to do on, on such a problem. So the reason I like this problem is this is an introduction to um, normalization of functions and variables, a very powerful tool. I teach this in 121 already because on 121 we can use it to our advantage to be able to plot things. It avoids the complexity of all these details. I don't need to know the value of R cubed to be able to plot this. If you don't know R cubed, you can't plot this function fundamentally. Whereas by using this normalization, I can do it. And this holds all the physics that there is to know about this problem. Well, this is kind of the what I wanted to do today, giving you uh, some examples of practice. Actually, no, I have one more exercise for you. This is going to be the fifth exercise, and uh, this one is not in any of the handouts. So I'm going to read the, the solution to you. It's an electric potential energy calculation. We're going to take three electrons forming an equilateral triangle, one millimeter on each side and we place a proton in the middle of the triangle. Find the electric potential energy of this group of charge. So we have an equilateral triangle. It hopefully it looks a little bit like one. So we're going to have an electron at the corners, at the APCs of the triangle. The triangle is an angle theta, and we know that theta is equal to 60 degrees in the equilateral angle. So we're going to call our, this electron Q1, Q2, Q3. In fact, we can even call it negative of this. That will give us a Q1, Q2, and Q3 as positive values. And in the midst of this, that is in the very center of the triangle, which is found by extending out lines meeting in the center of the opposite sides, right here, I, have, I place a proton, let's call it positive Q4, the proton. And this is the distance d that we're given. This is the one millimeter. d is equal to one millimeter. And of course, theta is equal to 60 degrees in the equilateral triangle. And the question is, find the electric potential energy of that configuration of charge. Well, we remember that now we're looking at point charges. And the point charges, um, we know how to calculate the, the electric potential energy of such an assembly of charges. We know that the U electric is going to be the summation on all the charges QI, QJ divided by 4 pi, oops, 4 pi 
epsilon zero and rij with this constraint in order to avoid the double summation of i less than j. So again, to, to uh, remind you of what that electric potential energy is, this is the energy, this is the work that I need to perform in order to assemble these particles. So imagine that I start with Q1, the electron. I place it in its final, com its final position right here. Then I take Q2 from infinity, I bring it in its location. As I bring it, these two charges are opposing each other, therefore I have to perform work. As I perform work, I increase the electric potential energy held within that system. I do the same thing with Q3. Now Q3 interacts with Q1 and Q2. I need to perform work against the, uh, the electric force acting between these three particles. And eventually I bring Q4. Now Q4 wants to be there. It is attracted to these three charges. But so I will be doing work, but the opposite polarity of work. If I were doing positive work here to build up the electric potential energy, here I, will, I would be doing negative work because it wants to go by itself. All right. So all we need to do now is look at these terms. So we have three electrons interacting with each other. So we're going to have three terms associated with the electron, the U electric. It's going to be three. Each electron holds a negative, a negative charge, negative Q. So it's going to be 3 Q squared divided by 4 pi epsilon 0. And then the distance between each of them, which is the distance D. Here is the electric potential energy term of the three charges, electron charges, at the APCs of this triangle. And then I need to take into consideration the proton. The proton interacts with the three charges as well. So plus three. Now the proton has a positive charge, positive Q, the electron negative Q. So the, it's going to give me negative Q squared. So I have a negative term there, negative Q, three Q squared. The three because of the three interactions with the three different electrons. 4 pi epsilon 0, and then I need to figure out what is the distance between the, the proton and each of these electrons. In other words, I need to figure out what is this distance, call it little r, here. Of course, it's very easy because this is theta over 2, so 30 degrees. This is d over 2, so I have um, little r is equal to, um, this is going to be the cosine, so this is going to be d over 2, uh, let me be careful about this, cosine of theta over 2 is equal to d over 2 divided by r, so d over 2r. Therefore, R is equal to D divided by 2 cosine theta over 2. Now, I just inject this back into the expression for U electric. Equals. And I can start to factor out some common terms. 3 Q squared divided by 4 pi epsilon 0. I'm going to have a D that comes out as well. And I'm left with the first term is fully taken, that's one, minus the second term I have, this is the D is taken care of, and then we have a two that comes, a two a cosine theta of the two that comes in the numerator. Here is the U electric for that configuration. So cosine 30 cosine of 30 that square root of 3 over 2 0 0.866 times 2 this is going to be 2371.732 yeah square root of 3 
So notice that this is going to give me 1 minus 1.732. This is going to give me a negative value. So this U electric of this configuration is negative. And if you remember that the U electric, or the, the change in the U electric, is equal to the negative of the work, if I have a negative electric potential energy, that means I have done a positive amount of work to, to assemble this configuration. Notice also that U electric appears to be defined as, in, as an absolute value, what that means is we have a reference electric potential, a U sub zero equals zero at infinity. Indeed, when the charges are infinity, there is no electric potential energy. The charges do not interact with each other. And so, I hope that was helpful. Um, please make sure that you do not skip steps. Uh, it'll bite you in the famous tush and uh, it will make your life miserable because as we get into much more complicated physics problem, as we get into magnetism, um, the complexity increases many fold. So the, these methods that we're setting up of analysis, construction of a solution, decent drawings, explanations, not following the formulas, but guiding the, the equations, uh, the construction of a strategy and the final analysis, all these are going to be very pertinent to later on when we get into more complicated things. If you have any questions, you know where to find me. Thank you.